Okay, um, this is chapter 8. It's kind of a long chapter, so we're going to split it in half. We'll do half of it this week and half of it next week. Uh, then uh, we'll do the, four, the 14th week, we'll do chapter 9, and then the 15th week is, is uh, going to be about uh, medication, uh, pharmaceuticals. Uh, and that's a, a lecture that I put together myself. There is no, there is no tenth chapter. I, there probably is, but it's kind of wraps things up. But uh, we're going to have put that one in there instead. Uh, so let's get going. This is uh, chapter eight: drug use and prevention from cradle to grave. As much fun as this is going to be. As much fun as there we go. Okay. Psychoactive drugs from birth to death. A fetus is exposed to heroin through the umbilical cord after an ad addicted mother shoots up. And that's what an addicted mother looks like. And that's what a needle looks like. A uh, 14-year-old is offered MDMA at a party to get rolling. To get rolling. A college student troubled by bulimia makes herself throw up five times a week. A young mother with three children hides in her room to smoke crack. A uh, 28-year-old IV methamphetamine user infects his girlfriend with HIV when having sex after using a contaminated needle. In one office, one worker is taking clonopin to deal with the anxiety, uh, while another takes Prozac to combat depression. And this is in a select office. A mother with grown children battles boredom and the empty nest syndrome by compulsively playing poker machines. As much fun as that sounds like. 50-year-old salesman on the road smokes and drinks to cope with his loneliness. A 74-year-old man with arthritis borrows hydro hydrocodone from a neighbor to relieve the pain. Uh, so what do we do as far as the, uh, the pregnant uh, heroin user is concerned? We encourage pregnant mothers to attend prenatal care programs to teach them how drugs affect their fetuses. And as you can see, this mother's got a footprint. <laughs> She's got a foot sticking out of her belly. That's kind of cool. Um, greater public scrutiny of parties limiting the use of club drugs. Uh, if that was the young man that was taking MDMA to get Brolin. Offering counseling to eating disorders in high schools and colleges so that people understand that bulimia is uh, something that needs to be combated using outreach workers to encourage drug users to practice safe sex and use clean needles to prevent the transmission of HIV and hepatitis C while attempting to bring them into treatment. And of course, this is the young man who infected his girlfriend with HIV. Uh, inter doing intervention to get a heavy drinking sales representative into an employee assistance program, or EAP. Holding seminars to enlighten senior citizens about drugs, drug cross reactions. And this is a 74 year old man that borrowed the hydrocodone from his neighbor because his arthritis was so bad. Each society has to decide how they want to attempt to prevent self destructive drug use. Are they trying to prevent any use of psychoactive substances at all? Are they trying to ban just illicit drug use? Are they trying to limit the damage caused by use, abuse, and addiction? And of course, this is, these are questions that come up on a continual basis. Um, so uh, marijuana is illegal in, uh, in Arizona. Are they trying to prevent uh, uh, marijuana usage completely? Are they trying to ban, just ban it as an illicit drug? Uh, wait a minute, uh, medical marijuana is still legal, and of course you can go up into Colorado and you can smoke all the pot that you want. Or do they, are they trying to limit the damage caused by, uh, by use, abuse, and addiction? Uh, and of course, uh, part of the problem is that uh, when we are, try to come up with a program to, uh, to combat uh, drug use, uh, these, all, the, all three of these questions come up on a continual basis. And you you actually have to guide your program so that you know what your goals are. Uh, you can't just have a nebulous program that, uh, that you have no answers to. So that you have to be continually answering these questions. The U.S. and most other countries use a three-tier approach to fight the destructive effects of psychoactive substances. 
The primary prevention is a program to teach the skills to help the individual resist drug use so that they never start. The secondary prevention is stopping the behavior wherever and whenever it starts. So if they uh, do start using drugs, uh, this, the secondary program is to get them to stop. The tertiary prevention, putting people through treatment and restoring them to health. Uh, tertiary, so the primary tries to keep them from ever starting. Secondary prevention get, uh, tries to get them to stop. And the tertiary uh, prevention program uh, tries to uh, get them to go to treatment and to restore themselves to good citizen health. It's good citizen health. Governments work on prevention by reducing the supply of drugs through interdiction of uh, drug supply, legislating against use, legal pen penalties for possession use and distribution, uh, reducing the demand by treatment of drug dependency and prevention through education, emotional development, moral growth, and individual and community activities, uh, reducing the harm that can be done to the community by promoting temperance, instituting needle exchange programs, supporting drug substitution programs, uh, lessen the effects of alcohol, uh, for example, uh, des using designated drivers, or support, supporting the idea of designated drivers, decriminalizing drug use. And these are all ways that governments work uh, to, uh, to prevent drug abuse. Worldwide, the most widely used and successful programs have been supply reduction and temperance uh, methods. Historically, in the United States, drinking and smuggling of spirits became part of the American fabric. Uh, this was before there was a United States, certainly. Uh, when uh, the East Coast was, uh, was the uh, 13 colonies was uh, part of England, uh, the smuggling, well, one of the problems, uh, and, and you may have learned this in history class, or may, you may have not learned this in history class, but one of the things that the British tried to do, they tried to dictate where uh, American uh, manufacturers or uh, American stores could be sold. Uh, so they wouldn't, uh, they, what they wanted was for uh, people in the United States, if they were creating something, they could only buy from uh, England and they could only sell to England. And of course, uh, the English were the ones that dictated how much money they could make. So they weren't supposed to trade with the French, they weren't supposed to trade with the Spanish, uh, they weren't supposed to. Uh, to go into the Caribbean and trade with anybody down there except another, except for an English uh, uh, firm uh, down in, uh, in the Caribbean. And of course, sometimes they weren't even allowed to do that. So smuggling became one of the ways that uh, uh, people in the United States uh, rebelled against, um, rebelled against, uh, England. <clears throat> uh, it was easier for farmers on the frontier to ship their corn produce uh, in the form of corn liquor than as grain. Uh, however, with the influx of evangelical influences, uh, there was a Methodist movement in the 1740s, and then there was a Baptist movement in the 1760s, I believe. Temperance became uh, more acceptable as an alternative to heavy drinking and drunkenness. Such behavior came to be seen as destructive, sinful, and immoral. An effort was made to get drinkers to switch from hard spirits to weaker beer, wine, and hard cider. Now, if you, uh, if you are aware of what was going on in England at this time, uh, the English were pretty heavy drinkers. Uh, they didn't uh, uh, drink beer and wine as much. They drank an awful lot of really heavy liquor, like uh, gin uh, was real popular in England. Uh, whiskey was was popular in England, uh, so it was the it was the heavier spirits that they were drinking. So one of the, the ways to uh, uh, to control uh, drunkenness was to um, uh, support drinking uh, lighter liquids uh, or less intoxicating liquids like hard cider, uh, wine, and beer. Dealing with the problem of alcohol consumption has been a continuing problem in the United States, fluctuating between moderation and forced abstinence, or prohibition. As a country, uh, use and the responsive movements have waxed and waned in 70-year cycles since the beginning of our history. Uh, in 1780, Dr. Benjamin Rush, who was a signer of the, uh, 
of the Declaration of Independence, tried to legislate control over distilled spirits. In 1850, the temperance movement supported replacing distilled spirits with more benign drinks such as cider, beer, and wine. In 1920, prohibition of alcohol started. Uh, of course, it was ended in 1932. In uh, 1990, legal drinking age was raised to 21 nationwide. Uh, in, before 1990, there were some states that uh, had a legal drinking age of 18. Uh, I grew up in Indiana. Uh, right next door was Ohio, and Ohio had a, a legal drinking age of 18, but you could only drink 3-2 beer. 3-2 beer was beer that had 3.2% uh, alcohol in it, uh, like Coors. Coors has 3.2% uh, is uh, 3.2 beer, and so is uh, Coors and uh, Budweiser is only 3.2, has only 3.2 percent alcohol. Did the 18th Amendment work? And of course, this is a question, this is an argument that you hear all the time, and a lot of times it has to do with who is defining whether it worked or not. Is it law enforcement that's defining it? Is it uh, the historians that are defining it? Is it the medical community that's defining it? Alcoholic uh, psych psychosis uh, ad admissions to the state hospitals in New York and Massachusetts was cut nearly in half. So if you were a medical person, then uh, yes, it worked because your half of the alcoholic psychosis uh, cases that you had were gone. Uh, deaths due to cirrhosis of the liver were cut in half during Prohibition. Once again, the medical community sees it as a success. Uh, there was less crime in general. Uh, so if, you're, if you are law enforcement and you're a local cop, uh, then probably you're saying, you know, uh, stopping uh, all the drinking uh, really helped uh, my community. There was less domestic violence. Uh, so once again, if you're a local uh, law enforcement, then you're saying, you know, this, the, the 18th Amendment actually did work. Even after Prohibition stopped, drinking levels remained low and didn't return to pre-Prohibition levels until the 1950s. A lot of people, when they looked at Prohibition, were, were thinking that it would cure all of uh, society's ills. Uh, it would cure... And, and, you know, obviously, uh, it, it can't cure all those ills. Uh, there, was, there was still bootleg uh, liquor. Uh, there were speakeasies and whatnot. Uh, but drinking went way, way down. Not only that, but they were, uh, people were drinking more benign drinks like beer and wine uh, rather than hard liquor. Uh, those uh, those uh, spirits were illegal. And it was very difficult to get a hold of them unless you lived in some place close to the Canadian border uh, or along the coast uh, where they would uh, uh, drop off uh, cases of, uh, of whiskey and gin and whatnot, vodka. Uh, medical problems increased from un unregulated uh, manufacturing of alcohol, but the level never approached the medical problems that the nation experienced from alcohol. So if we look at this from a medical point of view, uh, prohibition uh, worked. Uh, the 18th Amendment was very, very successful. Some argue that prohibition brought organized crime to the United States, but in reality, organized crime has been a part of the American underworld fabric since long before the 1920s. Uh, if you've ever watched um, uh, Gangs of New York with Daniel Day-Lewis and uh, Leonardo DiCaprio, um, really interesting movie, kind of a Kind of a, a dark movie, but uh, one of the things you learn is that there were there have always been these illegal gangs, especially in the ethnic communities. Uh, unfortunately, one problem with prohibition was that because banning alcohol was touted as a cure for all society's ills, treatment for alcohol addiction was cut. And, and of course, this was a problem because uh, when people became uh, addicted later on in the 1930s during uh, during the Great Depression. Uh, the treatment facilities were gone, uh, so we started up and things didn't work, didn't look very good. Some people claim that prohibition was repealed because of the universal condemna condemnation of the ban, but the real reason for its repeal was due to the need for tax revenues from its manufacture and use during the Great Depression. Uh, pressure from wets and fatigue uh, dealing with a continued argument did not hurt either. Uh, so there were a lot of different reasons for the repeal 
of prohibition. It wasn't like everybody in the United States was screaming that we needed to get to, to have a drink. Uh, the, there were, the only people that were really screaming that. Now, you have to remember that pro prohibition was uh, intact in uh, a majority of the states prior to the passage of the 18th Amendment. Uh, so there was already prohibition in, in, in uh, a majority of the states in the United States before uh, the, uh, the 18th Amendment was passed. In 1962, before the Civil Rights Movement hit its stride and before the Vietnam War, only about 2% of the American public used illicit drugs. This is when I was growing up. I was born in 1949, so in 1962, I was 13 years old. And I can tell you that there wasn't a lot of, of that stuff going on, and it was almost a joke. People would joke about, uh, about smoking uh, reefers <laughs> or, or uh, you know, take, shooting up with heroin. This was, this was, there was, and there was nobody doing this. So you, probably you didn't know anybody who had ever smoked a reefer, or I didn't anyway. Of course, I lived in rural Indiana. Uh, some people would drink beer, uh, and sometimes underage people would drink beer, but that was about the extent of it. However, with the aforementioned social movements and an air of social disobedience streaking through the youth of the 60s and 70s, 31% of the population was using illicit drugs. Uh, during this time, knowledge-based programs were started to teach about pharmacological effects of drugs, causes of addiction, health effects of drug use, legal penalties. There is no evidence that information alone causes changes in behavior, and unfortunately that is true. Uh, one of the things that happened was that uh, since there were so few people, only 2% of the American public had ever used illicit drugs, uh, this information wasn't out there, and people didn't know. Uh, individuals that grew up in, in my era, in the 60s and 70s, um, they weren't aware of what was going on, and uh, just like uh, all teenagers, they thought they were bulletproof, uh, so this stuff would never hurt them, it would never affect them. LSD, uh, marijuana, uh, heroin, uh, you know, all of these things, uh, they started using them, and, the, and as far as they were concerned, you know, they, they were only in their, uh, they were only in their teens and 20s or 30s, and they didn't think anything would hurt them anyway. So these people used it and uh, with ignorance, because they had no idea what was going to happen. They just did it because they were, they needed, they felt like they needed to rebel against society. Skill building and resilience programs, uh, as more research was being done, it was discovered that there were obvious psychological and developmental factors that predisposed select individuals to drug use. Programs aimed at these individuals targeted social skills that might protect the individual from experimentation. Skills that addressed risk factors that might lead to drug abuse included general competency building, uh, training and self-esteem, socially acceptable behavior, decision-making, self-assertion, problem-solving, vocational skills, coping resistance skills, developing self-reliance, confidence, inner resources. Skill building and resiliency programs reinforcing protective factors in resiliency, build on natural strengths that people already have available, uh, such as their optimism, their empathy, their insight, uh, their intellectual competence, their self-esteem, direction or purpose in life, determination, supportive friends and family, opportunities to belong to meaningful groups. Address and reverse uh, risk factors. Risk factors associated with future substance use disorders should be examined, with the focus being to seek strategies to minimize their development. Early aggressive oppositional disorder, poverty, lack of parental supervision, dysfunctional drug abusing peers. And of course, this is a picture of uh, dysfunctional drug abusing peers. They both have beers in their hand. You can tell because the bottles are green. It's either, it's either Mountain Dew or it's, it's beer. Could be Mountain Dew, I guess. Anyway, he's not gonna have any of that Mountain Dew stuff. That's crazy. That's crazy stuff. That's crazy juice. Uh, support system development, endeavoring to reduce stress for students, which uh, should decrease the need for drug and alcohol abuse. 
Uh, changing the environment, uh, one early target for concentration is the social and environmental influences that lead to drug use. Uh, family values, peer group values, practices in schools. This is an attempt to get the entire neighborhood to take responsibility for preventing substance abuse by assessing the needs of the community, coordinating existing services, changing laws and public policy to reduce availability, increased funding for family, school and community prevention, and community-wide training and planning. The public health model for prevention sees addiction as a disease. Uh, the user is a genetically predisposed host. The environment contributes to the problem. The drug is introduced, causing the disease. Prevention involves disrupting the relationship between one or more of these factors. Uh, let me take a drink and then we'll I'll continue. You can look at the lovely family. He's drinking gin and she's drinking white wine. The family approach, uh, this approach uh, sees addiction stemming from family dynamics. Families are bolstered through family support, skills training, therapy, and parenting, pro uh, parenting programs. <laughs> parenting. <laughs> this approach focuses on the family rather than the environment. Supply reduction seems to, seeks to decrease uh, drug abuse by reducing the availability of drugs and is the responsibility of state and local police departments, Department of Justice, uh, such as the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the Bureau of Prisons, uh, International Naturalization Service, Immigration and Naturalization Service, uh, the DEA, uh, Drug Enforcement Agency, the Treasury Department, uh, Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, uh, IRS, uh, the Internal Revenue Service, and Customs Service. Uh, Department of Transportation, of course, is part of this, and as is DOD. It's kind of interesting. Um, I was uh, watching a uh, news program uh, about uh, New Mexico uh, when I was there back in February or so. Uh, and they were talking about how the Department of Transportation had stopped a semi coming through the state, and it was full of marijuana. And the guy claimed that it was uh, it was hemp. And, uh, of course, uh, hemp has a certain level of THC in it, and uh, marijuana has a certain level of THC. So the idea was that they, were gonna, they, they tested the uh, uh, marijuana to see if it was hemp or not. And it turned out, oh, surprise, surprise, it was marijuana. <laughs> Up from Mexico. So you guys are, not you guys, but the Department of Transportation stopped a shipment of marijuana uh, coming in from Mexico uh, in a semi. And the Department of Defense. Um, when I was teaching uh, on the uh, Tinker Air Force Base, one of my students uh, started working in drug interdiction. Uh, this is when uh, we first started having problems with uh, uh, when we first started having problems with the cartels in Colombia, and we had just you know semi loads of, of uh, uh, cocaine coming across the border, and of course they tried to stop it. Uh, they tried to, they stopped at the border as best they could. Then they realized, well, what they really needed to do was go down to Columbia and stop it at its source. Uh, so uh, we, we started sending military uh, personnel down there, we, uh, Coast Guard, uh, Air Force, uh, and uh, I think the, well, and the Navy. The Navy was out in the ocean. And the Coast Guard was along the coast. And the Air Force um, were trying to uh, catch, uh, catch planes that were transporting uh, drugs. Uh, anyway, so he, and they, what they needed to do was, uh, was intercept the radio messages. And he, he was Hispanic and he spoke, uh, he was from Mexico, but he spoke, his wife was Bolivian. And so between the two of them, he had learned to speak South American Spanish as compared to, to Mexican Spanish, which I, evidently there's a difference. 
Uh, and of course, the drug, these drug people were Colombian, and their dialect was very similar to Bolivian uh, Spanish. Uh, so they, this guy became a, uh, started working in the drug interdiction, uh, and uh, really kind of fascinating. He sent me a postcard. Um, he was in my program. Uh, wait a minute, I've got it right here. He was in my program. Um, and uh, then he was, <laughs> and then he started, uh, where Al Suarez was a guy. Well, I guess I shouldn't have told you his name. Anyway, um, so he started working with drug interdiction. And I, I saw him at one point, and he, uh, he was in uh, Venezuela. As weird as that is. Anyway, he was in Venezuela. And I saw him, he said, uh, yeah, we went down and, and we were going to bust up this uh, uh, cocaine uh, manufacturing uh, factory. You, you remember what ha how they used to manufacture this stuff. And he said, uh, they sent us in with him. And, of course, he was Air Force. So they sent him in with, uh, with shotguns. And he said, <laughs> we got down there and uh, we started... Uh, we started sneaking up, it was at night, and, and uh, uh, we started sneaking up on them, and we realized, oh my goodness gracious, these guys had uh, uh, 30 caliber machine guns, and they had a 150 caliber machine gun, and everybody was carrying automatic weapons, and here uh, the Air Force personnel were just carrying shotguns. And of course, they, well, it was kind of interesting. He said that... Uh, they got as close to him as they possibly could and opened fire. And of course, since they were shooting shotguns, uh, they they took out most of the people that they needed to take out. Uh, anyway, with the shotguns, and he said it was it was luck because uh, then they started chasing. There, they, there. I, evidently, there were more guards than they realized, and the guards started chasing them through the jungle. But he, he survived. Obviously, he survived, or I, he wouldn't have been able to tell me this story. <laughs> but they, they circled back and they blew up the, or they burned the, uh, the factory. All that stuff is real flammable. Um, they have to uh, clean it with. Um, they have to break down the cocaine or the coca leaf with. Uh, uh, either gasoline or ketone or um, acetone, uh, really flammable stuff. And so they just lit the place on fire and it blew up. Anyway, so they just they stopped it. Uh, but uh, he, he said it was real interesting work. Uh, most of the time it was boring. As, it was really boring because uh, all they were doing was intercepting uh, radio messages. They were flying in AWACS. Uh, you guys don't know what the, I'm talking about. Anyway, uh, fascinating stuff. The responsible agencies reduced drug supplies by uh, interdicting uh, drug smugglers, uh, manning law enforcement activities at border crossings, limiting the supply of precursor chemicals, uh, disrupting chemical gangs and organized crime, uh, passing more severe laws, uh, increasing community police officers, disrupting money laundering and seizing assets, supporting local and state police in high-volume drug areas, supporting the anti-drug efforts of foreign countries, enacting treaties to work towards supply reduction. When I was uh, working up in Montana, uh, they were having a problem with crystal meth. And the crystal meth was being manufactured on one of the reservations, and they were having a hard time cracking down on it because the, the local police force... Uh, were part of the problem. Uh, they were turning a blind eye, or they were, you know, like I said, they were part of the problem. Uh, so they sent in a federal task force. They infiltrated uh, the group, and then one day they had this big drug bust uh, where they, they closed down all the meth labs. There's seven reservations. They closed down three meth labs uh, on two reservations. I'm not going to tell you which reservations. Anyway, uh, at the same time, they closed down the uh, police forces of those tribes and they replaced them with BIA officers uh, because they were so corrupt. Really fascinating stuff. Uh, my, the reservation where I was working, uh, we, they didn't have a, 
they didn't they had a drug problem but they didn't have they weren't manufacturing it it was just being marketed on the on that reservation uh, but this this drug bust just shut everything down it shut down uh, all of the uh, drug usage uh, in in uh, that the on the reservations in Montana uh, and it worked for well and by the time by the time uh, things got back to normal the uh, you know they replaced the uh, police department with BIA de police department uh, with BIA cops and and eventually of course they left uh, and they and they brought back the other policemen by that time crystal meth wasn't popular anymore so everybody was happy uh, drug laws in the United States have evolved to curtail the supply and use of illicit drugs. Long prison terms and forfeitures of assets have been used to discourage suppliers and manufacturers of drugs. Users are discouraged by facing stiffer and increased jail time. Uh, possession of paraphernalia adds to the length of time spent in jail. And of course, uh, this is what was happening through the 90s and, and into the 2000s. And now, of course, we're realizing that we have incarcerated a lot of people uh, for a long period of time, and what they really need is treatment. Uh, and so, this is one of the this is one of the issues of this election. Uh, one party is saying we need we need to to support treatment, and the other party is saying we need to support law enforcement, and we need we need uh, harder and harsher sentences. Many states, including California, enacted three-strike laws in the 1980s, which mandated life imprisonment if an individual committed three felonies in their lifetime. Since 1980, uh, prison populations have tripled. 55% uh, of the inmates in federal prisons were convicted of drug offenses. If you count felonies committed to support drug habits, the percentage increases to 60 to 80%. Over half of the inmates incarcerated admit to using drugs while they committed their offense. The percentage of teenagers is even higher. A great deal of money has been spent on supply reduction. Remember when I said that uh, in, the, in the 60s and 70s, uh, there was this rebellious attitude. Uh, they went from 2% of the, of the uh, uh, population to over 30% of the population. Uh, were using drugs in the uh, the late 70s. Of course, by that time I was in the military, and guess what I was doing? I was um, doing uh, uh, drug urines on people, as weird as that is. So instead of being part of the problem, I was part of the solution, I guess. That was my job. You got to do, everybody's got to do something, I guess. Since 1980, prison, okay, we've already talked about that. Um, what was I talking about? Uh, oh, the percentage of teenagers was even higher. Uh, teenagers think that they are, are imper impermeable, uh, that they uh, cannot be hurt, uh, that they're bulletproof, uh, that they can do anything that they want, smoke, drink, uh, drive fast while they're in, uh, uh, inebriated and uh, nothing will happen to them and of course a lot of usually they something had something does happen to them hopefully it's nothing fatal but sometimes it is something fatal anyway that's that's the same problem all all teenagers have the same ideas they're they're trying to to break away from their their boring home life and they they want some they want something new and uh so so they do stupid things uh, teenagers are, no, are notorious for being stupid. Uh, I wasn't, yeah, I guess I was pretty stupid when I was a teenager. I didn't do any of this kind of stuff. But um, I, I, I thought I was, you know, I was bulletproof just like everybody else. Turns out that bullets go straight and they, whatever they hit, they go through. So a great deal of money has been spent on supply reduction. Advocates estimate that it was uh, has resulted in a 10 to 15 percent supply reduction. Uh, I guess my point about teenagers is that uh, the teenagers back then were just as stupid as the teenagers today. Teenagers, and I apologize if you are a teenager, uh, but if you think back to your high school, uh, think back to uh, some of the some of the goofy guys or, or girls, for that matter, that. Uh, that, that did stupid things in high school. 
it's always been the same way. There have always been a cadre of people uh, that uh, just wanted to rebel. They needed to rebel. Something bad was going on at home, and they needed they needed uh, to rebel. And that's that's the way it is. Advocates advocate advocates estimate that that it has been result it has resulted in a ten to fifteen uh, percent supply reduction. What are we talking about? Oh, they have uh, spent all this money on on trying to uh, reduce the supply of drugs. Um, one of the arguments for uh, Trump's uh, border wall was that it would stop uh, uh, drug addiction or, or drugs from coming across the border. Of course, everybody keeps telling him that that's not that's not going to work. That's one of the reasons. The other reason is to stop immigration, of course. <clears throat> Um, the severe penalties have resulted in a delayed uh, impulse to use. It has opened up treatment. It has kept people in treatment. Uh, detractors of the policy complain of the minor impact on supply. These individuals support a more demand reduction approach. Demand reduction involves the three tiers of prevention. Primary, by promoting abstinence, uh, help young people refu refuse drugs. Delay the age of first use, encourage healthy non-drug alternatives. Uh, the age of first use is the strongest predictor of drug or alcohol use. Uh, individuals who experiment before age 12 have a four to five times likelihood of further drug use. Uh, interestingly, when I was uh, living in California, um, I was working for the Rand Corporation uh, and uh, the Lions Club came in and they want, and they, uh, contracted with the uh, with uh, with the Rand Corporation to uh, do surveys to find out uh, if a certain drug education program for uh, junior high students uh, would work. Uh, so we did research. Uh, we we gave them the the questionnaire. We gave them. We went into the lot. That I was Rand Corporations out in Los Angeles. And uh, we went into the uh, junior high schools in Los Angeles and gave them this questionnaire trying to find out how knowledgeable they were about drugs. It was really kind of fascinating. Uh, anyway, it's called Lion's Quest. I don't know if it still exists. There's the D.A.R.E. program. There's just a, a ton of different programs that focusing on uh, teaching young children to uh, resist uh, uh, drug abuse. It resist peer pressure and whatnot. There's the D.A.R.E. program. Uh, Lion's Quest is what we were involved with. Um, uh, I don't know how successful they have been, uh, but uh, I, I, <laughs> if they weren't out there, I, you just wonder if uh, more people would be using drugs. And I imagine when you were, you were uh, uh, students uh, of that age, some, they hit you with something, you know, with... And of course, you made fun of it, and everybody laughed and and whatnot. But uh, you know, if it keeps one kid from from starting a life of uh, of addiction, uh, then it works. Anyway, that's a primary program. Uh, secondary prevention seeks to halt drug use once it has begun. Uh, this tier of prevention adds intervention to the primary strategies of education and skill building. The biggest problem with this program is denial by the user and their concealment of use, making them difficult to identify. Another problem with this tier of prevention is that there is a lag phase between first drug use and physical and emotional problems. The user feels that the educational programs are overstated, and this is a problem. I had, I had a colleague who was a who smoked dope. He was a dope smoker, and he claimed that. Uh, there was nothing wrong with uh, with um, marijuana, and uh, he thought uh, that uh, uh, all of these programs calling it a gateway drug, well, that wasn't true as far as he was concerned. All he did was smoke pot. He didn't even drink. He didn't smoke cigarettes. Uh, he didn't use heroin or, or crystal meth, uh, and he thought that that was a bunch of bunk. But, of course, that's him. You know, if if we look at the if the grand scheme of things, if we look at the vast majority of people, most of them move from one to the other. Tertiary prevention uh, seeks to provide treatment for the user uh, to restore them to health. Uh, compulsive drug use is addressed through 
uh, group intervention focusing on detoxification, abstinence, and recovery, uh, Q extension per, uh, therapy that desensitizes the user to people, places, and things that triggers use, family therapy, group psychotherapy, or res uh, residential treatment, instruction in relapse prevention and life management skills, psychopharmacological strategies, promotion of healthy lifestyles, uh, development of support and aftercare systems, and this is part of the 12-step program. Tertiary programs result in decreased drug use or abstinence in 50 to 40 to 50 percent of the cases, 74 percent reduction in crime, uh, 2 million 500 thousand people receive treatment nationwide. Sadly enough, uh, yes, 2 million 500 thousand people can't have received treatment, but unfortunately, 21 million 700 thousand people are estimated to need treatment nationwide. That's about 10%, a little more than 10% of the population that needs it is getting it. Not all programs seek abstinence. Uh, harm reduction programs recognize that recovery is difficult and many will relapse before they are able to live their lives drug-free. This technique focuses on minimizing the personal and social problems caused by drugs. Three harm reduction programs, uh, needle exchange programs to reduce the spread of HIV and hepatitis C, and that's what this is all about. These are clean needles. It's better than, than using a dirty needle, trying to clean it out with Clorox and getting some blood st stuck in there. And then uh, everybody, everybody gets hepatitis C or, or, or HIV. Bleach uh, distribution programs to reduce the spread of HIV and hepatitis. Uh, legal drug substitution for illegal drugs. The replacement of heroin with methadone is a good example of the drug exchange program. Harm reduction programs have also proposed some controversial ideas. They accept the fact that people will experiment with drugs and they want to educate them to use drugs responsibly. Decriminalizing or even legalizing illegal drugs uh, treat uh, addicts by reducing their usage to, the to a manageable level rather than seek abstinence allow addicts to design their own intervention and treatment programs. Uh, these are fairly controversial. Uh, it's, like, um, uh, it's like handing out condoms in high school. Are you telling the kids it's okay for them to have sex? You know, it's the same way. You are, you're, you're talking to people about uh, using drugs responsibly rather than uh, uh, to become an addict. Uh, some of the most lucrative advertising on television is advertising for alcoholic beverages. Before 1996, hard liquor was not advertised on television, only beer. The idea from the temperance argument of the 19th century was that, that replacing hard liquor with beer would reduce drunkenness and the destruction of alcohol. However, more people die from cirrhosis of the liver caused by beer than cirrhosis of the liver caused by hard liquor. Damage done by legal drugs cause more damage to society than illegal drugs. Alcohol, tobacco, prescription drugs. Advertising for these drugs brings new users into the fold every year. And of course, I've had this argument over and over and over and over and over again with people. Alcohol is worse than marijuana. So why in the world? Why in the world is marijuana illegal and alcohol is legal? You know, that's that's one of the the huge arguments. Uh, uh, for legalizing uh, drugs. Uh, as it turns out, uh, Colorado has legal uh, marijuana, recreational marijuana use is legal in, in Colorado, and so is uh, magic mushrooms. Uh, shrooms are legal as well, as strange as that may seem. Facts to remember about prevention, there are no quick fixes. Uh, prevention will never be complete because there will always be new potential users to convince. Prevention campaigns become progressively more difficult in time because they have already reached the easy cells. No single approach has been shown to work consistently. Legalization of marijuana in the medical form of marijuana will make it more and more difficult to control all drugs because the, the argument will be, and I have heard that this argument as well, let's just legalize all drugs. Uh, that, that'll empty out our prison systems, it'll save us all this money, 
and of course the treatment for drug addiction uh, if they were all legal uh, would be astronomical and of course we would be uh, potentially destroying our children we'd be potentially destroying our uh, young adults uh, and uh, of course that would destroy our workforce and we wouldn't have enough people to, to do all the jobs. Uh, when we see depictions of drug addicts in the media, they are often portrayed as weak, bad, stupid, crazy, immoral, poor, and disenfranchised. One third of the homeless have a drug or alcohol problem. This only represents 5% of the addicts in the United States. The truth is that whites are more uh, the most likely to, to have either a drug or alcohol problem. African Americans are just as likely as whites to have a drug problem, but the least likely to have an alcohol problem. Hispanics are the least likely to have a drug problem. People in low-income areas are less likely to receive treatment and are more likely to be incarcerated for their drug use. More affluent people are more likely to receive treatment and probation. 53% of the individuals in prison for drug crimes are African American. 26% of those in prison for drug crimes are white. Among the highest paid occupation in the United States, physicians, they are as likely to be addicted as the general population, though they are more likely to be addicted to prescription, to prescription drugs. Member, members of Mensa, these are the gifted high, these are gifted people. Uh, these are brilliant people that have high IQs, and gifted high school students have high rates of addiction. Members of the clergy have high rates of alcoholism, especially in the Catholic Church. While addiction rates fluctuate with attempts to, to curtail use, over the last 40 years, the age of addicts has declined with the age of first use. Between 1991 and 2005, the number of 8th through 10th graders who used marijuana increased 60%. Juvenile arrestees testing positive for drugs uh, other than alcohol ranged from 48 to 65% in 2005. It is estimated that 18.6% of infants are exposed to alcohol in the womb, 4.5% of fetuses are exposed to cocaine, 17.4% of fetuses are exposed to tobacco. Fetal alcohol syndrome is the third most common birth defect and the leading cause of intellectual disability in the United States, and it's preventable. Drug use during pregnancy can create nutritional and obstetrical <laughs> complications, can cause anemia, sexually transmitted diseases, uh, diabetes, high blood pressure, neurological damage, weakened immune system, poor nutrition, hepatitis C exposure, endocarditis, HIV, and AIDS exposure. Eighty percent of the infants born with HIV in the United States were born to mothers who were IV drug users or the partners of men who were IV drug users. Worldwide, the figure is 90 percent. Unfortunately, the life expectancy of a child born with HIV is only two years. With AZT treatment for the pregnant mother, Rates of HIV infection dropped from 25% to 8%. One of the things that you need to remember is the HIV, um, HIV started in the early 1980s. We've been looking for a vaccine against HIV ever since, and we still haven't found it. AZT is a treatment. It keeps people alive. It's not a cure. There is no cure for HIV. Pregnant addicts often live chaotic lifestyles that don't afford time or the wherewithal to seek or accept prenatal care or medical intervention. When the addict is an adolescent, the individual is at greater risk and even less likely to seek treatment. Other problems are likely because of her physical, emotional, and behavioral, behavioral immaturity. Besides the effect of the drug on the fetus and the mother's toxic environment, often has deleterious effects on the fetus and the mother. Poor nutrition, bloodborne infections, domestic violence, sexually transmitted diseases. Most psychoactive substances re readily cross a placental barrier, meaning that the tiny infant is exposed to the same drugs at the same level as the mother. After birth, the drugs will be passed to the baby in the, mother, in the mother's breast milk, 
uh, because of the excessive organ and brain development, the 12 weeks in the first trimester is the most critical period in the baby's life. Drugs used during this time period can change the baby both physically and mentally. Uh, however, since the brain continues to grow throughout gestation, neurological damage can be done at any juncture during gestation. So the mother should stay away from drugs and alcohol the entire time of her pregnancy. That's for nine months. If heroin or cocaine is used during the last trimester, they might cause premature birth. If the baby is born after the mother has used drugs on a regular basis, the neonatal period will be fraught with intoxication, withdrawal, and eventually developmental or learning delays. My niece, and I've told you this, she's my great, great niece. Wait a minute. She's my great niece. Uh, she was a heroin addict and she got pregnant and she used during her pregnancy. And when she gave birth to my great, great nephew, he was addicted. Not only was he addicted to heroin, but uh, when she came in to deliver, uh, they did a drug test on her and they found that she had uh, a great deal of heroin in her system. Uh, so one of the things, the, one, the first thing they did was take the baby away from her. And they gave her to uh, they gave her to my brother and uh, and his wife, who was the baby's great grandparents, uh, which wasn't the best thing in the world because the mother, who was also uh, uh, addicted to select things, uh, was living in that household, and uh, they allowed the uh, the heroin addicted mother to have access to the child. Uh, of course, that's that's part of the problem. They almost charged her with, uh, they almost charged her with, um, uh, what did they call it? Uh, they almost charged her uh, for uh, harming the baby, but they didn't. And the reason they didn't is because she suffers from bipolar disorder, and uh, there's not a whole lot of controlling this individual because of her mental illness anyway I'm it's 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 kind of an ugly ugly story and it just makes you want to punch somebody in the face if the infant is uh, given concentrated care after birth they will manage to catch up with their dr non-drug exposed peers potentially by toddlerhood alcohol is one of the most devastating effects on a fetus of all the drugs the effects of alcohol have been studied more than any other psychoactive substance because of its pre uh, prevalence and the general acceptability of the drug. Now, she was on Facebook during her pregnancy. Uh, now I didn't. She wasn't one of my Facebook friends, but uh, I think my wife was. Anyway, uh, anytime she had her picture taken while she was pregnant, she liked to show off her belly, for one thing. Uh, the other thing was she always had a lit cigarette uh, in her hand. Uh, uh, her idea was that if people saw her smoking, they would think that she wasn't using anymore. But of course, she was still using uh, heavily, quite heavily. So you, you probably ask, how's the baby? Well, the baby was, uh, well, I, I've told you this before. The baby was addicted to heroin. Uh, it took him six weeks to detoxify the baby. Uh, he seems to have ADHD and uh, he can't he, he doesn't pay attention to people uh, so if they tell him uh, you know don't walk out the door he's walking out the door and they say stop you shouldn't walk out the door he doesn't listen to you he just goes on he just keeps going um, that's that's the only problem that I've really seen uh, well we'll see what happens he's I, I don't know he's five years old now when a mother drinks during pregnancy, the possible effects on the fetus are referred to as FASD, uh, fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. Uh, the most severe form of uh, FASD is uh, fetal alcohol syndrome, or FAS. FAS is characterized by physical abnormalities, mental abnormalities, behavioral abnormalities. These babies are born to mothers uh, who drank heavily during their pregnancy. Uh, last time I was home, my brother told me that uh, the kid has uh, these horrible temper tantrums. Uh, sometimes they just he just 
throws a fit for no reason whatsoever. Uh, he's, he's really hard to deal with because you can't tell him no. If you tell him no, uh, sometimes he just he doesn't pay any attention to you. Uh, and sometimes he'll he'll throw these temper tantrums, so they're trying to get that under under uh, control. As weird as that is, uh, growth of the uh, fetal alcohol syndrome fetus occurs in the womb. Uh, reduced height, reduced weight, reduced head circumference, uh, reduced brain growth, reduced brain size, uh, facial deformities, shortened eyelids, uh, thin upper lip. Uh, flattened mid-face, uh, shallow groove in the upper lip, uh, heart problems, limb problems, delayed intellectual development, neurological abnormalities, behavioral problems, visual problems, hearing loss, balance, and gait problems. And this is an individual who is a teenager, and as you can see, his head is kind of small. Uh, the circumference of his head is still small. He also has an intellectual uh, deficit. Part of the fetal alcohol spectrum disorder are less severe disorders, alcohol-related neurodevelopmental disorders, or ARND, uh, alcohol-related birth defects, ARBD, uh, worldwide FAS affects as many as 2.9 per 1,000 births. In the United States, the rate is 2 per 1,000 births. Among African Americans, the rate is 6 per 1,000. Uh, 1, uh, Asians, Hispanics, and whites have rates between 1 to 2 per 1,000. American Indians have rates between 10 to 30 per 1,000. Of course, this has to do with uh, the region of the country the individual is in and, uh, well, the region of the country and the, the tribe. Some, some tribes are, uh, control, are able to control uh, the uh, alcohol consumption in their tribe uh, due to uh, traditional values and others uh, not so much. Uh, the the uh, American Indians that have the biggest problem seem to be the Northern Plains tribes. Uh, that would be the uh, most of the Sioux tribes, the Crow, uh, the uh, Grovant, the Black, Blackfeet, uh, the Mountain tribes, the Salish Kootenai and whatnot. <clears throat> Suian speakers and the Algonquian speakers. In one study of FAS uh, adolescents and adults, it was discovered that, that, that all of them had been physically and sexually abused, 60% uh, of the abuse occurring before adulthood. The individual averaged, individuals averaged six diagnosable mental illnesses. Select ones had 10 or more mental illnesses. Cocaine and amphetamines are used by 558,000 women in the United States every year, with most of them falling into the reproductive viability range. They are reproductively viable. In the 1980s, when cocaine use was at its peak, it was estimated that 4.5% of all babies born in the, United States, in the United States were exposed to cocaine in the womb. In inner city uh, hospitals uh, where cocaine use was more prevalent, the percentages ranged from 15 to 25 percent. Uh, during the 1980s, I got out of the service in 1983, and uh, my wife had an assignment to off at Air Force Base. Actually, I would, that was my last assignment was off at Air Force Base. And uh, I started working at Children's Hospital in Omaha, and this was a really serious problem. That was in 80, 84, 85 and 86, uh, February 87, I went to another hospital, but uh, for four years I worked at uh, the Children's Hospital in Omaha, and this was a really, really serious problem. Uh, one of the areas that I worked was uh, in ICU at Children's Hospital. It was pretty miserable. So one of the, one of the things, uh, of course, it was, we got a skewed idea of what was going on, uh, because as a, we were a regional children's hospital, uh, and we used to get uh, cases from South Dakota, uh, from Nebraska, of course, because we were in Omaha, and from uh, western Iowa uh, and uh, northern Kansas. Yeah, northern Kansas. So, wow, it was, it was interesting. But like I said, we got a skewed view of things because if somebody had a... Uh, a 
if a, a baby was had been exposed to cocaine uh, or heroin or whatever, they would bring them in, and we got to deal with them. And it was not the most fun thing in the world. The effects of stimulants increased heart rate, uh, constricted blood vessels affects not only the mother but the unborn fetus. For the fetus, the constricted blood vessels result in restricted blood flow, restricted nutrients, restricted oxygen. This retards development, of course. For habitual users, the effects can be more pronounced. In extreme cases, the increased blood pressure may cause the placental to se placenta to separate from the uterine wall, resulting in spontaneous abortion. Excessive use of stimulants can raise the fetus's blood pressure, causing a stroke. Using in the third trimester can result in extreme activity in the fetus, causing uterine contractions and premature labor. Withdrawal for the fetus involves several weeks of extreme agitation, increased respiration, hyperactivity, and possible seizure. And as I told you, my great, great nephew, right, great, great nephew, uh, it took him six weeks to detoxify. <clears throat> Effects last in the child's second into the second child's second year with lifelong disability rates of 33 percent. Since opioid use tends to be more continuous than the binge use of stimulants, the effects are greater. Problems include severe infections from IV drug use for the mother, fetal growth retardation, miscarriage, stillbirth, separation of the placenta from the uterus. Babies born to heroin addicts are often premature, smaller, and weaker. These infants have abnormal sleep patterns that leads uh, to 600% increase in SIDS deaths, sudden infant death syndrome deaths. Uh, 60 to 80% of babies born to opioid addicted mothers go through withdrawals two to three days after they are born. Uh, hyperactivity, incessant high-pitched crying, increased muscle tone, irregular sleep patterns, increased respiration, poor suckling, failure to thrive, irritability, sweating, tremors, diarrhea, sneezing, vomiting, and death. Marijuana is used by 5 to 17 percent of pregnant women during their pregnancy. A longitudinal study of marijuana exposed fetuses in Canada showed that poor uh, short-term memory and verbal reasoning at age three, continued poor memory through childhood, lowered verbal performance through childhood, impulsive hyperactive behavior, conduct problems, distractibility, poor executive function. Okay, now why in the world are we doing this study in Canada? And the reason is because they have, uh, uh, marijuana isn't really legal in Canada, but it is, they don't punish uh, people for using marijuana in Canada. Uh, so there has been more marijuana usage in Canada over the last two or three decades uh, than there have been in the United States. And because of that, they've been able to do more research than we've been able to do in the United States. Uh, and this is what they discovered, as you can see. So memory problems. The child will uh, potentially suffer from memory, memory problems all their life. Uh, this is the other big one, the impulsive hyperactive behavior. Uh, this is very common with, uh, with these individuals. I think I've already told you the story that the first, uh, the first crack baby in um, Oklahoma City uh, tried to shoot me. <clears throat> um, impulse, impulse and hyperactive behavior. Uh, he had no friends whatsoever. Everybody hated this kid because he was, you never knew what he was going to do. He could smile at you and punch you right in the face. I mean, it was really kind of bizarre. Uh, I was his favorite teacher, as I told you before. Came to my door one day. Uh, I opened the door. I was, it, was, it was my planning period. Uh, I, I went, uh, he knocked on the door. I went and opened the door, stuck a uh, pistol in my chest, and pulled the trigger. Uh, and... Uh, with the biggest smile you ever saw. And like I said, the bullet, as I said before, the bullet jammed. Uh, the coach was walking past about that time, saw the pistol and pulled it away from him. And of course he broke his finger, pulling the uh, uh, gun out, uh, out of his hand. Uh, the, the mother tried to sue us for breaking his finger. <laughs> but, you know, that's the way she goes. 
and there was a bullet in the uh, in the gun. Uh, there was one more bullet in the gun, but it was jammed in the in the chamber. It had uh, he'd slammed the uh, uh, he'd, he'd slammed the uh, what am I thinking of? Anyway, I every time I tell the story, I can't remember what what's what's going on. It's a little upsetting, as you can imagine. But I'm not dead. Uh, the problem with marijuana is the same as the problem with any other drug smoked. Uh, decreased oxygen, irritating, irritated alveoli and bronchii in the uh, lungs. Decreased weight, withdrawals, abnormal responses to visual stimuli. Increased tremulousness, easily startled, high-pitched cry. Drug fetal effects, uh, category A, vitamins other than A, uh, no fetal risks, category B drugs, uh, acetaminophen and ibuprofen, no fetal risk effects, no fetal uh, risks, category C, most medications, no fetal risks, category D, anti-seizure benzodiazepines and tetracycline, tetracycline is an antibiotic, uh, and anti-seizure medicines are what you give somebody for uh, epilepsy. Uh, benzodiazepines are for anxiety. Fetal risk, but the risks are considered appropriate to the need of the mother. Category X, teratogenic, uh, Accutane, which is tetracycline, actually. It's he a heavy dosage of tetracycline. And vitamin A, that's uh, carotene. Uh, fetal risks are too great for the benefits. So if a mother is pregnant, uh, she should stop taking her uh, Accutane is given to people for acne. And vitamin A, of course, is uh, uh, normally in, uh, in vitamins. I think I have vitamin A in my, in my vitamin pills. Let me go check. Oh, let's see what I've got here. Oh, golly, it's so tiny I can barely see it. Let me see if I've got vitamin A. Uh, vitamin A, 50% as beta carotene and 50% ret retinol acetate, 5,000 international units. I get 100% of my daily dosage. So if I was pregnant, which of course I'm male and I'm over 50, uh, <laughs> I shouldn't be taking these vitamin pills. So, so if uh, I run across somebody who's pregnant and they forgot their their preg their pregnancy vitamins I, I can't give them mine because there's vitamin A in it. Any medication prescribed for a pregnant woman should be closely monitored. Use of NSAIDs, non-steroidal uh, anti-inflammatory drugs, can elevate the pregnant mother's blood pressure. Benzodiazepines can accumulate in the fetus's blood, even at safe levels for the mother. Because of the fetus's smaller system, it will take longer for the infant to clear the drugs from his system and may be born addicted to benzodiazepines. Because of the slowness in clearing the infant's system, the baby will be born with withdrawals that may persist for weeks if the mother has that serious an anxiety that she has to take it. At the turn of the 20th century, women rarely smoked. In the 1920s, only 5% of pregnant women smoked. Pregnant women smoked, uh, smoking peaked at, in 1997 at 28.2%. As a matter of fact, uh, I saw an advertisement uh, from the 1950s. It was a doctor, and he was telling women that if they had morning sickness, that uh, tobacco took care of it. And he suggested they should smoke. They should smoke cigarettes to get rid of their morning sickness. That was in the 1950s. In 2005, only 22.5 percent of pregnant women smoked during their pregnancy. 17 percent of the women smoked cigarettes. 8.82 percent smoked right up to the time they gave birth. The highest rates were among African Americans at 20.12 percent. The second highest rate was among whites at 14.2 percent. Cigarettes are especially dangerous because of the nicotine and the carbon monoxide found in the smoke, along with 2,000 other compounds. Both carbon monoxide and nicotine cross the placental barrier and reduce fetal oxygen supplies. Women who smoke or come in contact with secondhand smoke are in greater risk of premature delivery. Heavy smoking mothers are twice as likely to miscarry or have spontaneous abortions. 
So if a woman is pregnant, she should not only not smoke herself, but she should uh, stay away from uh, secondhand smoke. In other words, not go around. If her husband smokes, he needs to go outside and smoke. Uh, and if uh, the family smokes, then, then she needs to not visit uh, in, inside where, where she'll get a lot of secondhand smoke. Babies born to heavy smokers average a birth weight uh, 7 ounces less with a smaller head, circumference, uh, and about an inch shorter. With heavy smokers, there is a higher incidence of cleft palate, congenital heart defects, minor nerve and brain defects, a higher incidence of sudden inf infant death syndrome, a weaker sucking reflex, depressed immune system, more respiratory infections. Caffeine is a common drug taken uh, in by uh, pregnant women in tea, coffee, and soda pop. In one study, 75% of the babies born had caffeine in their system at birth. Infants tend to have lower tolerance for caffeine than adults. Caffeine seems to have no long-lasting effects on the child, though physicians warn pregnant women away from, uh, from its use during pregnancy. My, when my daughter was pregnant, she was pregnant, uh, she got pregnant at 41, uh, so she knew that uh, it was a, a bit of a gamble uh, being pregnant. Uh, so she, and, and she's a biology, <laughs> she's a biologist uh, and a chemist, uh, so she knew uh, the dangers, and we, we both, of course, I teach this class, uh, so we were both aware of uh, uh, all, all of the markers that uh, potentially could uh, mark the child as having a problem. Uh, so, wow, uh, one of the things she did was uh, uh, she stopped drinking Diet Pepsi, which was her, her favorite drink, of course. Uh, so she stayed away from caffeine completely during her pregnancy. And, uh, of course, the baby turned out perfect. Uh, that's my grandson, of course. Uh, how, how, how else could he be but perfect since he's my grandson? Just kidding. Prevention of damage uh, should start as soon as the woman discovers that she is pregnant. Uh, physicians will ask the woman the four P's. Uh, parents, did either of the women's parents have a problem with drugs or alcohol? Partner, does the woman's partner have a problem with alcohol or drugs? Past, has the woman ever drunk beer, wine, or liquor? Pregnancy in the month before the woman knew that she was pregnant, did she smoke cigarettes, take drugs, or drink beer, wine, or liquor? If necessary, the woman can be treated for her dependence. And that's what they tried to do with my niece, my great niece, uh, and it didn't, didn't work. As a matter of fact, she doubled down on her, her heroin, the supplemental stuff that, that they were giving her, and... Uh, her uh, baby daddy was the uh, her local supplier, so he's giving her anything that she wanted. Why don't we stop right here, and we will pick this up next week, uh, and I will finish this chapter. So that is it. Sorry for all the ugly and unfortunate information. Uh, uh, stay safe, and I will see you next week. I hope you voted. If you didn't vote uh, absentee, then I hope you uh, will vote. Uh, you'll go down to your poll play, polling place and vote. doesn't matter how you vote as long as you do. Uh, next week, I will be involved with, uh, poll, with the polls, uh, and it will be primarily all week. So I, I, and I need to tell you guys that I, I'll be uh, gone all next week uh, because I'm... Since I'm up here in Iowa and I, I live in this county, um, I can uh, I, I can uh, be involved with all these things. And I've never actually been involved with these things before. Of course, I've been teaching at Diné College in, in Arizona, where I'm not actually a resident. Uh, I've been doing that for, uh, for five years. This is my fifth year. So next week, I will not be available for office hours and... Uh, if you need if you need something, email me because um, uh, I will be reading my emails at least once a day. Uh, I will be I will be in the counting office uh, where they're counting the ballots, uh, so I will not be have access to anything uh, in, in, to the internet. As as weird as that may seem, I know you guys couldn't be away from your cell phones for that long but I'll be okay. I'm 71 years old and 
and I'm not addicted to my cell phone. It's not, it's not implanted in my in my hand or anything. So I'll be okay. But anyway, okay. So uh, next week I will be uh, incommunicado uh, for most of the week, except by by email. So please, if you have a question about anything, oh, your papers are due next week. Um, uh, I expect to see your papers whenever you finish them. Uh, you need to finish them before December so that I can grade them. Uh, uh, I don't count off for late work. Uh, just get them in whenever you can. And uh, have a great week, and I hope you vote, and I hope the right person wins. So whoever that may happen to be. So whether it's, whether it's your favorite senator or your favorite presidential candidate, favorite senator, candidate for, for Senate or whatever. Anyway, I'll see you guys uh, later.